only once, but it seems that everybody wants to know where retail trading is headed. Our panel of speakers is here to provide clarity on the issue, and then we leave you in the trusted hands of the panel moderator, Brian Griffin, ex-CMC Markets and FXCM, and today the COO of the recently launched Sutton Secular Trading. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I've got to give my panel uh, two minutes each to uh, introduce themselves and talk very briefly about the challenges we faced in the last six months. I'm going to start from the start of recovery, so please introduce yourself and tell us how things have been. Good morning, everyone. My name is Toby Gore, and I'm the CEO of Leverage. At Leverage, we uh, produce a first class uh, trading technology for almost a decade. We provide everything a broker needs from the back end to the front end to risk management and CRM systems. And uh, our pride is that over the course of this decade, uh, we kind of look into the future every time, again and again, and we're able to foresee what is coming in. And uh, I'm sure we will discuss a lot where the retail the trading world is going. But if you go into regulation, if you go into the uh, mobile adoption, if you go into marketing challenges, all of that is where leverage is already there and uh, providing the solutions for the future. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Ron Cohen. I'm the founder and CEO of Traders Group. Traders Group was founded to rethink the way the industry uh, attracts and retain its clients uh, through enhancing uh, the experience of traders. Uh, we did a long time with Traders Education and Marketing. This expo, we launched Traders Platform and our platform uh, Status Trader, um, which takes everything a uh, trader needs and put it in one platform, creating an experience which is there is no second. Um, we invite everyone to, to, to experience it. I think the industry of, of the future here is going to a way that traders will need platforms that give them something that they can feel confident in and be trading, uh, allowing them to trade easily with knowledge and, and, and success. Thank you, Ryan. My name is uh, Abner Ziv, a friend called Lady. Uh, I started my journey 10 years ago. I was studying Chinese for four years, lived in China. Uh, Around nine years ago, worked at Ito at the early beginnings, then the UK based uh, gaming company in Gibraltar, and then six years at Safe Church, payment processing, and the past uh, year and a half I joined Zota Pay Deal. Uh, Zota Pay is a one stop shop for payment app technology that uh, basically connected to more than 200 acquired banks, PSPs, alternative payment methods, e wallets, voucher systems. And everything uh, that basically a user, end user, can fund his account. Our target markets obviously is uh, forex and binaries. And uh, we are here today to speak how users and workers are uh, affected from the changes that made recently by the regulators, by MIFI, by Visa, etc. So, hi everybody. Good morning, and uh, thanks to IFX Expo, to Moshe, to Gar. Thanks to the mayor and the mayor for again. We only kicked off yesterday, but it looks as uh, looks again as uh, promising and a very good, uh, good version. I, I have the uh, opportunity, you know, I'm, I'm here since speaking since the first IFX Expo in 2012. I remember it in May 2012, back then, five years ago in the Grand Resort. Things have been changed. Uh, I think that one day afterwards we, we had a regulation panel and everybody was then registering uh, companies in Anguilla and doing unregulated forex. Uh, many of these activities probably is, is, is a matter of the past now. And uh, I think it will be really interesting to see what's going on. I'm Al I'm based in Tel Aviv. Uh, I think it made it a marvelous standard and really exciting to, to see uh, also new faces and familiar faces both here on the, on the panel and here in the crowd. I think that what we'll see here in the next uh, few years is we'll see more and more regulated brokers will see, I believe, a shift from uh, binary options into uh, forex CFDs, simplified forex, which is a nice uh, term if you heard about it, simplified forex, uh, but more and more uh, legit 
I'm not saying that binary options is not legit, but I'm saying that I think that in the next few years we'll see more and more classic financial instrument trading and back to the hardcore. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Scala. I'm the uh, Bubble Head of Sales at Forexware. Um, the title of the panel is What's Next for Retail Foreign Exchange, and just talking to some of the panelists earlier, I reminded myself that I started 20 years before the Euro, so I started in this business. So I've seen what's happened to institutional FX, originally traded by phone, and now the question is what happens next to retail FX. Uh, Forexware, we build platforms, uh, front end, back end, uh, NFA compliant application systems, online application systems, and risk monitoring systems. And I think, uh, as Tyler brought up the regulations, I think regulators are more concerned with risk, and we've seen what risk can do to some of our bigger uh, friends back in the U.S. and uh, some of the issues that they've taken on. Risk is a very important part of this business, and we provide uh, some extremely useful risk management tools. So, turn it over to Good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Duncan Hansen. I'm, I'm slightly younger than Fred, um, but I uh, started uh, in the industry uh, futures uh, on some of the larger exchanges around the globe. And since then, I've now become uh, CEO of Technology in the UK. Um, we are a relatively new broker in the space, but we also now uh, started uh, Technical Prime. And certainly today, uh, we are looking to um, offer anyone that may be a, uh, 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 a small broker or someone looking to get into the space in the broker industry a um, uh, potential for, for prime services. As a broker, we offer MT4, uh, we're looking at MT5, and we're now looking to increase our exposure to other asset classes. Thank you very much. If you need that, we can look at that. Thank you. Um, while you're on the mic, Duncan, we'll put the first question to you, and we'll keep it pretty generic. What do retail FX clients want? They want, they want opportunity. They want uh, to be given decent products, and not necessarily complex products, but they want a full scope. So. Uh, a client still um, spread sensitive? To a certain extent, but, you know, when, when, you look at a, when you look at a broker, you want to know what funds are safe. You want to know that that company is going to be there for some time. You want the service. The spreads is part of that, but it's not It's not the biggest part. I've answered that question to tell me, are clients leverage sensitive? They are, but I think most of all, I think the question should go into uh, the different kind of traders. So the other actually the other professional ones, the other ones more uh, price sensitive, execution sensitive, they will be the one to look for the brand name, obviously to make sure that the money is in a safe place. When you talk about the newcomers, the new traders, they are totally different animal. And even within them there are different types. Uh, there are the newbies, they have no idea what trading is all about, trying to learn from experience and so on. So they need to have a soft entry into that world. Uh, one of the things that we see leverage is social trading, that it's very nice, long, into that world. So we don't know how to trade, we don't know what to do in terms of indicators and so on. It's all big Chinese to you, uh, but you, you're able to start very slowly. There are the millennials generation, they work on mobile, period. We don't have a desktop, they don't have web platforms. So we see a lot of trends from based on generations, based on ages, going into working into mobile. So I think all the office parts are there, must be there, execution, etc. But someone, uh, the progress needs to think who the real uh, customers are. How about Ran? Tell me your experience with the average retail client. I think in the end, uh, we all know our clients, our clients are risk lovers. They have a different degree of, of, of risk loving, but each one of them has a risk lover. Each one of them has a risk mechanism that allows him to make him trade. And now the one thing they need from us as all the brokers is a platform that enables them to do that in confident. All the information they need, they shouldn't look for it, it should be on the chart. All the, 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 the expert advice, the social, like Kobe is saying, simplicity, like Tali is saying, this should be embedded inside the trading mechanism. 
Uh, we should think about trading in forex not only in lots. There's other ways, risk amount, trading amount, uh, ways to make forex trading simple to the end user. I mean, talk to me about payments. What what does the average user plan look for? Look for? Okay, so in regards to the first question first, what I believe the traders are looking for is the best product available. They are not they are much more mature than they used to be. Let's say seven years ago, we would have seen only professional traders using MP4 or MP3 back then. Yeah? But today we see this market is getting open for uh, more newbies, uh, unprofessional, unprofessional traders, and people that would like maybe to buy a share of Facebook or Google. And they don't have the tools or abilities to do Fibonacci charts and so on. Or Bitcoin. Or Bitcoin. And I think today the, the big uh, challenge is how to enable these products to the user. From payment side, the user, we have, we have two aspects. A, it's localization. Uh, users, and I define it to seven different regions around the world, whether it's EU, China, Japan, Southeast Asia countries, GCC regions, CIS, which is Russia, and Southeast uh, uh, South America. In each region, we have different providers, local providers, local cards, methods, local wallets, uh, different than just regular Visa and MasterCard. So the user, whenever he's engaging with the product, and in order for him to feel more confidence, he would like to see the most preferred payment of method, what he's going to buy in the supermarket, whether it's Moneta or the JCB. So on the payment page itself, he needs to see also a wide diversion and a wide range of payment options that are not just Visa, MasterCard, the traditional. Second is about the security of the funds and how fast we can deliver products for paying payouts, especially the payouts. Today, a broker, a, for a trader, for a user, is supposed to be the bank. So he has a balance, I have my bank account, I have my card, I can top up, I can withdraw my funds, I need my funds within. 24 hours maximum. In China, for example, you cannot survive more than, let's say, one or two hours later. Already, people will write you on the phone that you are very or something like that. So, the payment aspect will make the product, because it's, at the end of the day, it's payment. So we're talking about money and money service industry. So, also, the pay the payouts should be easier and more secure for uh, the end So. It's payments now part and parcel of spread, leverage, executability, charting, it's equally as important. Yes. And here we can see that the industry as a whole will take less risk on a ticket size amount. So the number of lots or number of deposits the end user can do is uh, relatively less than he could have done a few years ago. That's why we can see a shift for wire transfer solution, online bank transfers that uh, enable users to send more money or biggest uh, higher amounts of money. For credit cards, we can see maybe $10,000, maximum $20,000 deposits, which means according to the number of slots, you can execute the credit card. Okay, thank you. Tal, any views on that? Any views on that? What's your last one? Yeah, well, I totally agree with what Lady said. Um, uh, if in five years ago, six years ago, lots of focus of us and our clients was uh, refining the terms and conditions, uh, we had dealing with some enable options of, of key employees moving from one broker to another. I, I believe that in the last year, the, the most critical issue of our clients in order to get alive and about the water is exactly something they did not speak about. The wire solutions, the banking, the, the regulation, and making sure that they can get the money and, and, and pay Promptly. And what, what happens like in, in, in the Far East, it's, it's even more. A, he said that if you're flying in uh, Southeast Asia, you mentioned China, but in Southeast Asia in general, go get his uh, withdrawal in two hours, you write the email. No, you can even come to your uh, booth in uh, money uh, fair in China or in Shenzhen or, or anywhere else and, and come and, and, uh, and start uh, or come to your office in, uh, in Cyprus and. Uh, and uh, and then and, and the like your brand and your image because you didn't pay him in, in, in two days. So this issue of, of payments becoming became a very focal point. And uh, this is the only uh, into, into new solutions in, in the wild, uh, and not only wild, in, in, 
we have an our clients that are dealing with bitcoins, and the bitcoin is also becoming a very critical uh, uh, and, and interesting uh, um, instrument. You can see people uh, or companies like Bitfinex that gives a uh, client to uh, to go on and, and to and to trade on bitcoins and on other virtual currencies. But again, uh, you spoke about uh, uh, the leverage. We don't see like 50 or 100. With Bitfinex, it's three, three for the uh, leverage. And I think that's that's. And enough for, for clients to feel uh, energized and to trade on them. So to summarize, we still see more and more issues uh, that have been in the past, like the bogus uh, the terms. But I think that the most critical issue that we see in our law firm, we work with many of the exhibitors here uh, as the legal counsel, uh, we see that the, the, uh, the, the number one issue is now the, the payments and to make sure that the, the regulation that they will have, whether it's Vanuatu or, or MIFI, will, will, will get them uh, the ability to get the payments fast and make sure that also the payoff will be fast and the client's funds will continue to be secure. So it's a brand issue? Yes, it's, it's a brand issue, it's an operational issue. It's all together and it's a critical issue because <coughs> if, if a client cannot get, has $200,000 stuck in a bank in Singapore, because the bank in Singapore doesn't recognize your, your license, it's a critical issue. The we cannot pay the salary and we won't be there. Thank you. Fred, same question. What do clients want? Well, I, I think it's um, it's the same for both retail and institutional B2B clients. They want security, security funds, security knowledge that the partners will be around, uh, a fair playing field to know that uh, prices aren't being manipulated, and they want execution. We see it in the B2B world where credit was a very big issue in the last uh, several years since the S&D event. It's very difficult to get a true prior broker now. With Citibank, um, one of the senior members of the Citibank prior broker group had told me right before that event, he says, you know, we, we have 40% of the FX market, and I don't know if we're doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing, time will tell. And now we've seen them pull back a great deal, but credit's become a big issue. Uh, so people like Duncan are moving into the private crime space. We've seen a lot of people try to fill that gap, uh, provide liquidity, provide security, uh, and provide a uh, fair playing field. We, we've done a lot of that ourselves. We've worked in that to try and uh, bring uh, clients through it in a more, uh, in a more focused way. You know, oh, let's talk about liquidity. I mean, what is liquidity? Maybe we'll ask the question back down to Duncan. Liquidity for leverage is very easy for us. It's just another bridge to be completely provided out there. I think in many ways uh, for the big brokers, uh, it's a mean of life. And you can't live without this. It's something that someone must have in order to serve its customers. Uh, the thing is that we see a lot of uh, brokers that still live on the uh, B-book side and still are interested in making the extra buck from, from B-booking the, the traders. And for them, liquidity or risk management as a well, whole is, is less uh, important. So, uh, looking into the future in terms of what regulation will do, uh, I think that we'll see less uh, people who can trade brokers. Uh, again, brand recognition, the things like you mentioned with the loss of payments and banking will also impact the small scale. And we'll see a lot bigger uh, ebook and, and traditional uh, brand names. And from that, obviously, the liquidity will become more and more. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I disagree. I think the risk is going to wind up somewhere. And I think brokers have realized that holding risk is what makes them profitable. Uh, you know, so whether it winds up in the hands of the bank or it winds up in the hands of the broker, somebody's going to take that end risk. So many of the people sitting in this audience have realized that. And they've lived with the premise that 80% you know, of the clients are going to lose their money. Well, that's the way it was over the last several years. Clients are getting a little bit more um, sophisticated. There, there were so many interbank traders that were sitting in, uh, in interbank daily rooms 10 years ago that aren't there anymore. The banks have downsized to the point where a lot of those people have taken their ten dollars $20,000 account and opened up accounts with brokers. So they become clever. And it's just a matter of the brokers becoming a little bit more clever and how to manage that. So there's not a one-size-fits-all um, in terms of risk, I think you have to know who your clients are and the portion that this is going to I agree, and the, um, uh, the brokers have become far more savvy now about how they manage 
express. And there are plenty of uh, routes that they can do that. Uh, it's uh, you know, about blending what they have, it's about finding the right uh, execution spot for them to um, offload that risk, but also keep everyone happy. And a client himself you know, wants to know whether he's SDP, whether he wants to know whether he's, uh, uh, you know, he's going to be internalized by a, by a management site. Um, so one has to take from the client all the way up through to the you know, ultimate risk data, you know, which is a bank. But one note on that. I think that someone, every broker is not uh, to, to be uh, ignorant of the fact that the uh, traders are well savvy, read a lot, know a lot. It's not the 20 years ago that someone went into some brokers and put his money and hoped for, for the best. Right now, all the traders know what they do, know what to look for. They're not talking about the newcomers, but the old ones. And the, the ones that will identify that their brokers is edging against them within the system will take this as a bad point. So I agree, someone, a broker needs to be in a position that he takes more money from whatever, where, wherever he can and whenever he can. But traders will be extremely sensitive to know that the broker is not against them. And it, it's on a safe level field and everyone knows that uh, broker X does people to, to that extent and broker Y does not and they will go where the money is more secure and more safe, and there's no conflict of interest between the trader and the broker. Is that kind of sensitivity regional? Extremely uh, regional. We see a lot of uh, the uh, <coughs> brokers in, in the EU uh, are much more regulated in, in their way of working. It's simply a matter of, of evolution. Uh, when you go to the east side, uh, you see more sophisticated traders in terms of the trading capabilities, but much less sensitive to uh, such kind of people can be able to from the broker side. Um, maybe a related point, how the product is delivered. We spoke about GUIs front ends, we spoke about um, mobile apps. What about API? Everything is different. Again, the, the payments that you would probably call that, it's different in each part of the world, a different acquirer uh, or, or uh, anyone behind the scenes. Uh, from a technology perspective, we need to adhere to more uh, different opinions, regulations, and, and rules. If you just look at the EU, it's no, no longer just ISEP. You have you know, the French regulation, the Spanish one, and obviously FCA. And although everyone is under the MIFID umbrella, the flavor is, is sometimes totally different, and the interpretations are different. So for us, as a technology provider, we must provide the, the uh, different flavors. If you go to the East, Again, different China is way different from Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and so on. So, for a broker that wants to be international or global, uh, the uh, compliance challenge is not just on the way the compliance officers and operation works, it's also on the way that our systems are, are adhering to the regulation. And uh, for, from that perspective, as, as we have customers almost all around the world, we see a lot of requests and demands from our customers to be compliant for specific regions, for specific regulation. Okay, thank you. I agree with what they probably said regarding the regulation topic, but we see it as a trend. I also spoke about like that in Europe, if you compare it to the other, other jurisdictions, there are different, uh, in some places you don't really care if, it's a, if you're a trader, if it's an A book or B book, if your a, a broker is really covering itself with, it, with full liquidity or it's like a people old school broker in GCC countries, in our Gulf states, or in, let's say, for instance, brokers which are, start, which are targeting clients from uh, Bahrain, from, uh, from Saudi Arabia, we'll see in most of the cases, unless they're a UK regulated broker, there will be a, a, an MP4 or an MP4 clone uh, with either non regulated or unregulated, and in most of the chances, it will be people, classic people in most of the cases, but it said in, in, in very, in very much in the European, uh, in, in the European clientele, it will be more, more, more able and more, uh, let's say, more regulated. But the interesting thing is that there are more and more workers that want to do, to go like they go to the supermarket and they want regulation. So you can see, and in, in recent, in, in recent years, we see more and more workers that have different type of regulations, and that will be called regulation shopping. 
So we've seen that, uh, let's like, say, five or six or seven years ago, the people opened the Seychelles company, opened the Samoa company. The Samoa is now kicked off because what happened with Mosca and Fonseca. Dominica also, since February 2017, is not a place for unregulated default for buying anymore. So normally people now use the Marshall Island company for the for one, and then they use the Vanuatu license, and then they add the Mifi license. And as Tommy said, it's not only Cyprus. People do Mifi also through Greece. People do Mifi through FCA, even though the the, the days are, 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 are counted because, as we all know, regarding Brexit, we don't know what will happen with all these FCA regulated companies. But this idea of, of having a, 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 a broker that takes the regulation from this and that and that and have an office here and there and Hong Kong, it's becoming more and more frequent and not only for the big brokers, also for the small ones. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I would say it's uh, regulation shopping, it's more regulation protection. Uh, you know, brokers have to do that. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit like a sort of uh, game of football. You start off, you know, you get the ball, you get the team, the staff, everyone like that. Uh, you have a game, and then the next day you turn up, and there's a rugby ball, and then you talk to play rugby, and then you know all the rules are. So you have to, have to ensure that you, uh, you know, you, you or, or try and predict where the market is going. And once well, not putting the blame down on the regulators themselves, um, but you've got to, you've got to ensure that you can operate, you know, not just today, but tomorrow and in the future. Fred. Yeah, I mean, we, we see that as well. We do a lot of white label startups, uh, Chinese. We have an office in Beijing and Shanghai. We do a lot of white label, gray label startups. And a lot of these groups start up as uh, unregulated and unregulated venue. And as that proof of concept wears itself on, wears itself through, then they start to move to a regulated entity. And as they grow, uh, their regulations grow with them. And you know, we've seen that happen over the last two or three years. And it's still beginning. Uh, people look for as I said, the unregulated, then move to a uh, 125 SCA regulation, and then uh, move on to the 730 to get to that point once they uh, realize the capital. I mean, so <clears throat> what we can define today, especially from the payment side, that uh, you have the big players, the big groups, uh, owns multiple regulation in order to be compliant in several jurisdictions around the world. So you can see big players as EU under MIFI, they have Seychelles or Belize license for the rest of the world, and they even have either Vanuatu or a company which is not regulated at all for, let's say, the toughest markets like Japan, for example, when it's Quinta. So the big players, they have a more than one regulation. They cover themselves, as you call it, a protection suit for regulations, and it depends on the IP or the region the trader came from, they will in diverting to the, regu to the regulated channel or to the best channel for them that will be less exposed. Now, these groups, obviously, uh, in terms of banks, you have different banking services for Belizean regulation than the MIFI ones. However, these guys are taking uh, the package of the group, the whole group, to European banks, and basically submitting everything into the bank and enjoy for all the activities, they enjoy uh, very low pricing, European pricing based uh, targets. So at the end of the day, the whole group enjoy also a very highly regulated environment. Right. How sensitive are, is the average retail client to regulation? Well, I think it is important. Regulation is a must have today in the industry, and we understand it. Payments, everything is basically connected to it now uh, on the plant, so, so it must be once the entity is growing, like my friend says, um, growing from an unregulated or starting from regulated. But I think in the end, there's a, there's a, this is something uh, I heard before, in the end there is a trader sitting in a trading platform, pressing a button to trade, and, and, he, and he gets to try again, or re -quote. And we see it in the Financial Commission and the part of, we see brokers that doesn't have the most amazing risk uh, capabilities, and, and the execution, I think, is one crucial part that uh, brokers need to pay attention. If it's other risk uh, uh, companies that are doing it for them, or they should have done it instead in-house, but regulation is not the only thing they need. They need capabilities capabilities to allow their traders to actually trade. Well, what I'll add is retail traders are gamblers. Right? 
they start with the premise that they can take a $5,000 account and make $100,000 on it, which is unreasonable to begin with. And I don't think they're looking at the news of where the problems lie with various brokers. They want to trade. Right? It's the institutional guys, it's the, uh, it's the brokers out here who are saying, I don't feel safe with putting my money with this broker because he's got a bad reputation. I don't feel safe putting my money here. Where the retail trader, he sees a tight spread, he sees a, uh, a fair execution policy, he wants to trade. We're still, we're still seeing that with brokers that have had their names in the news recently with a lot of scandal attached to them that are still doing reasonable volume. So and, and traders want to trade. So it's back to my original question. What do clients want? I mean, they want to in a grid regulation, they want payments, they want leverage, they want And they want to get three. They want to get three. The the they want to get three. Tell me if I'm wrong. That's what we try to produce. This is what we try to provide them an experience to, to three them in the end of the day and to make them come back. To come back and to stick with our company, our platform. And, and this is something everybody here in this room is looking for, stickness. In these traders. So the talent is changing, evolving? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day they are. Uh, you see again two trends. You see the trend of the uh, old school traders that are in this business for the last five to more than that years. Uh, they are already very savvy with uh, trading tools, with analyzing the reports, with uh, working with technical uh, instruments and analysis and so on. Uh, they're looking to be, they're very price sensitive and obviously execution is part of it. Uh, they want to trust the brokers. The other trend that you see between different traders are the newcomers. Uh, and as I mentioned, if we look at them in terms of ages and honestly everything sits on tons of information that we can analyze all the time. So we see a lot of new generation coming in. I'm talking about the millennials, the 20 plus, the ones that want to manage their own money, not give it to someone else to manage for, for them. And, and for them it's totally different game. They're very, they're learning very fast. They're taking the courses that Ron mentioned, that they're learning a lot from YouTube, from podcasts, from whatever instrument that they might have. They're trying a lot with small amounts. Uh, and for them, I think the experience, as Ron mentioned, is more than anything. By the way, not just with the training, this is the way of life. This is what they expect from their Snapchat, or from Facebook, or from whatever. This is what they expect. Great experience, very uh, simple and an easy way to trade and everything that is more complex, everything that is more sophisticated, they will try. Obviously in two years when they're into the game, they will move there. But the beginning is looking for something very simplistic, very straightforward, uh, and this is they will stick with the ones that give them a the good experience. Um, I, I, I totally agree. It's uh, client clients are getting far more sophisticated and, and, and quite right. There's an enormous amount of information out there. Regulation, um, uh, payments, uh, uh, well capitalized companies, find it on the internet, go to a company's house, you know, uh, you, can, you can check out a company, see how, how well they're doing. But probably more importantly, it's convenience. A one stop shop for a client is, is, is the ultimate goal for them. And I think as a broker, that is where we're trying to, trying to get to. And we have NT4, NT5. We need multi asset platforms. So right there. And this is where clients, I think, are going to be really, um, they're, they're going to push the boundaries because um, they can start trading all these different asset classes. They can trade with uh, AEs or, or any other sort of algorithms and uh, artificial intelligence. And that brings them up from not just a, a retail client, but uh, it's like a mini hedge fund now. And that's where I see the market going. Tom? Yeah, also. The marketing and something uh, has been quite changed in the last year. Uh, all these uh, funnels of make make money, how to become rich. You know, in the last year there was the M Fune saga. There was a guy called M Fune who uh, all 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 London, all the tabloids spoke about M Fune that he was walking in the McDonald's and then a few months after he started trading in binary options. He bought a Bentley and he coated it in, 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 in gold. I don't know for all of the people that know about that story. But it was amazing. You know, you opened the, you opened the, the sun and you saw that story about that guy that from McDonald's instantly by trading with some unregulated water become a millionaire. Now, if you dealt more deeply in the story, you understood that this guy, Emkin, that his name, he was actually an affiliate of that brand. 
And he actually did something very interesting. He made he invented the story, he made himself rich very quick by buying a twenty thousand pounds Bentley and coating it with some kind of paint. And that that was the story. And when when all was discovered, it, it did a very very bad, bad, bad reputation to the industry. I think that all this uh, fake trading software and lots of funnels that had been uh, traditionally being serving uh, binary options funnels, we don't see them anymore. We see now more and more. Uh, uh, more solid marketing, more less fake news, as we all know this term fake news that has been coming in the last year, very trendy. Less fake news, more honest, more stuff like uh, Andrew, see Andrew, is, Andrew has been Andrew from, uh, for finance, he's been reporting all these fake news in this, uh, uh, in this paper for, for, for the last month. We see less and less, uh, and I see that uh, that's one trend that we, that we now see. A, a second trend that I will refer to you, I, I, I read a week ago, and, uh, Finance Finders published a, a very interesting, interesting uh, industry report on uh, moving the people to, to, to uh, Eastern Europe and the cost of outsourcing. Uh, I think the Avi Mizrahi uh, uh, posted it. And uh, it's interesting to see that even regulated brokers uh, now use the, these places, but make sure that all of these personnel are, are working according to the law with good terms and conditions, with good marketing. And I hope that this will continue. I think that for all of us to meet here each year, here in, here in Cyprus, and in Hong Kong, that, that has to be the, the direction. I believe that all of the people here on the panel agree. I mean, yeah, a couple of uh, <coughs> remarks on that. So uh, I'll start in and say today's crowd and traders are basically they have limitless amount of information. Google, mobile, we have powerful smartphones, each of us in our pockets, not me, but each of us. So in one couple of clicks you can see a person's website, where he was born, where he lived, what, uh, who he was studied with, etc. etc. A trader today, he doesn't have to be a guru to understand that the Brexit or something happened in uh, Manchester and they're bombing, so maybe the pound GDP will go down. So the amount of information, the flow of information, the freedom of information is much more flawless than it used to be. And therefore traders can execute much faster. Now, the other side of this issue is that traders don't like to work, or any people don't like to work so much to get this information. So for them, they want just a couple of clicks to be able to execute the trade, to change the trend, to add the top up, to maybe to change the level rate, and so on and so forth. So what we used to see is that traditional, professional uh, traders, be, today they become gurus. They used to be traders, regular traders at the broker lunch. Because they know how to trade today, they become gurus or uh, MMPs, PMS, where basically they teach other people via social trading platforms, uh, people can trade on them, they will get kickback on their skills and specialties. So basically today we see a swift and change. Individuals around the world that, let's say, Ecomo or Tradio or any other uh, social trading platform has 20, 30, 40,000 followers, meaning 40,000 people that execute the same trading that they are. It's more than the biggest uh, uh, investment house in Israel, the number of people, for example. So this is a, the accessibility. Hey, Don, I think the key word here was teach. The brokers, as we see it, going to educational marketing. They take it to the, uh, like they say, to the uh, regulated level. They produce marketing using educational content. And basically, this is the new way of attracting clients today. We see it a lot in traders' education. Most of our content is being is embedded in a lot of brokers, but the last year we have numerous uh, offers of being in the, or, or to integrate our content to uh, media providers, networks. We see that as the new way of marketing. People are going to get inside the forex first of all, but by knowing what it is. What is a peak? What is a, a leverage? How, how do you uh, execute a trade? How do you open an account? The basic things think that people need to know before they even go and register in your platform. When they know that and go later to your platform, everything is going a lot more easier from getting the compliance you need from them, from them to trading. So, what keeps clients trading? What keeps clients trading? Yes. The continuous confidence you provide them. Streaming of uh, broadcasting through the websites of broker, which allows them always to get more, more and more information and confidence in trading. 
making them a bit more trader every day. I think what keep, keeps clients trading is the dream. You know, this is the dream that the dream that they're going to hit the next one. They're going to catch that next wave three trend. They're going to catch that next 300 point move. I had a uh, conversation with a former CEO of a large U.S. broker many years ago, and he said, uh, "You know, I'm selling the adult male fantasy." He said the young man's fantasy was, "You see those two beautiful women? I dated both of them." The adult male fantasy is, do you see Dolly in? I bought it at 102. <laughs> you know? So, and I think that's what we are. We're still selling the fantasy. You know, there's great opportunities in this market. I've been, as I said, for a long time. I've been a very good living doing this for a long time. And I'm sure a lot of us uh, out here have done the same thing. But the idea that you're going to take a $3,000 account and make $30,000 a year on it, or $50,000 or $100,000, it's unsustainable. Probably. Uh, first of all, it's a bank call. If you lose the money, you don't have anything to trade with. But I totally agree here. It's the dream that keeps the traders coming in. And uh, as long as they have the funds or the belief that they can do something, and, and, and they kind of wake up from the dream very fast. And they realize 3,000 will become 300, 3,100, and so on. But they will still, still wait for this one event that will make them uh, rich. But even on that event, they, they kind of think they're gods now, and they can uh, do it again and again and again. And uh, at the end of the day, I think that this is what everyone, is, every broker sees this is reality. Uh, there's only very few traders that actually make it even more. We see a lot of algorithm trading. Uh, you know, so this is it's a large part of our business. So I, I, I don't see it going for the big one. I see it as a challenge. Individuals want to challenge themselves, and if they've got the right tools, you know, you can start creating a strategy, you can back test it, you can forward test it. Anyone can do that nowadays. So it's not, uh, I, I, I don't subscribe necessarily, although it does happen to go for the big one, but it, it gives people a more sort of cerebral sort of um, escape thing. And, and if it works, then you become his one. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. The only way to stay in this business is discipline. And uh, if you have a model, and the model is discipline of how you get in and how you get out, and you, uh, every time you enter a trade, you have your education strategy in place, that's the only way you're going to be long-term successful. We'll come to the final questions, and we'll start with Duncan again, and a pretty straightforward question. Projected changes in the industry over the next 12 months. You can talk about regulation, you can talk about products, you can talk about how it's delivered. It's so whatever you feel. Next 12 months. Next 12 months. Um, we, we've, we, we come off the back of a, a, a strong growth, and we anticipate our growth to increase exponentially as well. We are, you know, we're really confident in the, in, in, in the business. But you've got to keep pushing. Um, yeah. Regulation. How? How are you doing that? Well, it, it, it's it's not reinvention, but it's we're looking for new products. We we want to offer you know futures options, uh, individual equities, you know, at some point. You know, the, the one thing that's sort of halting, I think, the whole industry at the moment is is regulation. It, you know, we've got Mifid two coming up. We've got uh, the Emir rewrite, uh, and, and and these are really sort of important things. So for for an SCA regulated entity. Um, so we're, 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 we want to, we want to, we want to push on, and we will do, but the next 12 months are going to be really interesting. Um, if, uh, if the SCA can help some, you know, leverage uh, policy that, that doesn't work, if, uh, if there's some negative balance uh, issues that they want to impose, you know, these things are game changers. Okay, thank you, Fred. Um, you know, I, I was up here last year, last year's panel, and I think I'm saying the same things again for the next 12 months. Uh, risk management, I think brokers are more focused on risk management. As we've all said, clients are getting more sophisticated with their algo training, with their discipline training, and brokers need to manage risk. It's what the regulators want to see. Um, so we, we're providing tools, we're upgrading our tools, and it's one thing that we're really focusing on, is providing better risk management tools to the industry. And the second thing that I've said last year again is MT5. Um, we're seeing more and more focus on MT5. Uh, 
know, we put together a, a, a gateway seed future pricing for, for equities and futures to be able to pump into uh, NT5. We've just completed our bridge for, uh, for overall OTC FX and CFDs, the full depth of book for asset managers. So I think we're seeing more and more, uh, and I know we're seeing more and more inquiries about NT5 going forward, and uh, hopefully this year it starts to pay. Thank you, Frank. Tom. Yeah. Well, one of the things I will mean, continue to see in the next year, I believe, is a uh, more accurate marketing, more uh, honest broker, less non-regulated ones. And I'm just, uh, we spoke about AB, but AB, even starting with the Vanuatu license, it's also a good step from moving forward from the marginal non-regulated ones. So I think that for the next year, there will be less and less non-regulated brokers. And on a, on, a, on a global scale, what I, I do think that there will be like a convergence of all the financial entertainment uh, uh, sectors. And I believe that more and more brokers, even the, the guys with the nice suits, will start operating other, uh, other operations. Maybe it can be a Bitcoin trading arena, maybe a casino. You know, people think that casino and online gaming is here and financial trading is there. It's not that different. You know? it's, the operation is not that different. I think that at the end of the day, in the next year, we'll see more and more brokers going into casinos, online, uh, slots, uh, having Kurosawa regulation. It's not that far. It, it's, it's not that far. And I believe that it will continue. Okay. Definitely will continue. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting year for us. First of all, I think the Forex industry has changed uh, tremendously in the last six months. And we see these changes are going and growing in uh, the next six months as well. The main reason is the uh, Visa US acquired Visa Europe and imposed basically their uh, regulation, their compliance procedures on the European uh, finance as well. So we have uh, MIFI 2 and uh, SISIC 2 accordingly and Basel 2. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but it's new set of regulation. Uh, how EU banks uh, should transfer money in and out how to conduct the compliance and uh, what procedures. Basically, the, re the real changes or the, more, the major changes is that EU company must have physical offices in the EU, must transmit the URLs, execution, everything from the EU. So the offshore regulation, what we used to know with the subsidiary in the EU, just for processing purposes, is not relevant. Therefore, and also we see uh, the biggest changes is on the regulators. Every day, every week, we knew we hear a new set of regulation or uh, rules that brokers need to comply. We see now uh, they're not only uh, for the brokers themselves. It's about the leverage, about the bonuses, the name of their sales representatives, the IB and marketing divisions. What you can say, what you cannot say. So basically everything is going to be more regulated or uh, these guys are going to shift into the non-regulation or different uh, opportunities, as Tarbo mentioned. We can see today the obvious from binary option to Forex, but we can see also some of them are going to diamonds trading or Bitcoin or uh, in cryptocurrencies and so on. The main thing is the uh, brokers has to stay a cost-effective operation, otherwise in today's world they won't be able to last for the long run. And, uh, and what I wanted to say last and to come back my, uh, conclude my uh, saying, we have to remember that always the user, in the end, the trader, is the one we are approaching. The user experience, what he will feel. Remember yourself when you go, and I'm sorry about the analysis, but if you go to a casino, you have your fun, you don't mind to, to even lose $1,000 that night, because you get an experience. I'm not Combined, I'm not saying Forex is casino, but if a trader will get an experience, will get something nice, will get good customer service, support, email, and so on, he won't necessarily be upset when he lose the money. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think, first of all, in the next year, we will see growth in, in both unregulated and unregulated brokers. I think the dream exists not only in traders, it exists also in brokers. That, wants to become brokers, and, and like we said, they will go to the unregulated at the beginning. Um, I think in the, to differentiate yourself in the next year as a broker, you need to choose your products carefully, make sure your products enables the traders the experience he wants and needs, 
and make sure it's stable. Stable, and of course, uh, risk department are a part of it. Um, marketing, like we said, is going to be more legit to get traders that will stick with you and not play with $200 a day. And, um, and, and I think experience is everything. Okay, thank you. I want to say regulation because it is the obvious answer, but I want to take it from a different angle. One, I think that the regulators will not only focus on the good guys, not only on the one that already licensed. I think that one of the things that we'll start seeing is them chasing after the unregulated ones, uh, trying to block them, trying to block the uh, internet side, trying to uh, get the cease and desist orders and so on. This happened in other industries, exactly the same stage in the evolution that the, that the, the retail for exists and we'll start seeing this more and more. I think it's because of the fact that the licensed uh, brokers that invested the money are, are suffering from uh, declining revenues. So they will start complaining to the regulators, they will come into effect. Uh, the regulators will, will scratch their head and say, okay, that, these guys are right, let's start chasing these guys. On the other side of the regulators, I think that the big brokers will start looking to other jurisdictions. Uh, playing just in, in their normal field, in their neighborhood, will, will stop. Obviously, this is their home base, this is what they continue to do, but they will start looking into new revenue streams, uh, new countries, new places where they can, they can basically have the same operations and get new uh, money flowing in. And the most obvious aspect will be either Latin America or the uh, East, uh, maybe around Southeast Asia, not necessarily China, although we see more and more international brokers stepping into China, but it's a totally different beast. And no one really knows what to do there and how to operate there. Uh, never is there in the last two years, and, and uh, I'm proud to say that we, we had gained a lot of experience, but in that sense, we're still learning a lot. So this when it comes to regulation, and, and the other point goes to uh, the cost effectiveness that maybe I mentioned. Uh, the pressure on the cost side, think about the brokers. They pay tons of money to uh, bring traffic and to the sales team. They need to be more cost effective, they need to lower their cost structure. And probably the only way to do this is through proper marketing, and more automated marketing, the technology side of this, allows now more sophisticated deep learning, uh, big data elements to focus what is going on. And I think, you know, I think we already see more and more brokers implement very sophisticated tools uh, to enable them to, cost the, to cut the cost on the marketing strategy. Everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have room for one question, don't clap just yet. Uh, we have room for one question uh, before we uh, head to the next panel. Okay, this is good news for me. Are we sure we have no questions? Questions from the audience and the audience, that is. Any questions from the audience? Okay, great. It seems you all know where retail trade is headed. Thank you very much. <laughs> don't go too far. We then have to start our next panel delving into regulation. A uh, very important topic as you all heard. Thank you very much and thanks again to our panelists.